Hika haya tabo koya tabo kasha tabo kundra bakiete. Father, I come before you and I just thank you for this word that you're bringing forth. I pray that I deliver it the way you want it delivered. You've already changed what I was going to say. So I thank you, Father, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Father, this is your meeting and this is what you want. And I just submit myself unto you to do what you have in store. And we give you glory. Amen. As I said before, when I came back from the trip that we took, just the time away, there was four different points that next Sunday that I hit. And one of them was that I have not been putting forth the kingdom of God. I would gotten away from what I was supposed to be doing and ended up going into other things. Trying to set up organization, trying to do different types of situations that actually were not wrong, but they just weren't right. So I got back and I started to evaluate while I was gone what was going on and the Lord started to speak about what was happening. And I says, wow, I have kind of slipped sideways, repented, repented to you that day and went on from there. And through that process, I said, Lord, I want to do what you want to do. And I felt like there was no way that I'd be able to complete what the Lord had called me to do. But he gave me grace. And he hasn't taken anything away yet, but I, I was getting close. And I said, man, it's a little scary. So... I have really been in and seeking the Lord and finding out exactly what needs to be done. And this week I ran across the teaching about the kingdom of God. And he says, that's what you're supposed to be preaching. That's what you're supposed to be teaching. That's what you're supposed to be bringing forth. Because that's what it's all about is the kingdom of God. I says, great. And what I heard... I thought it was kind of amazing, so some of we've talked about, but I just found out the other day somebody told me sometimes you need to hear it 20 times before you can get a revelation of it. So I'm going to hit it again. This one may be just a little different than what I put out before. The priority of Jesus Christ is the kingdom. If we do not make the kingdom our priority, we are messing around with what God wants to have done. Because I was going to start with some other things, and God says, no, I want you to go right back here and talk about this. I said, okay. Kingdom, as I said last Christmas, I said, what do you want to teach on me? And he said, teach on why Jesus came. Why did Jesus come? To get us saved so we can have a good life and go to heaven. Wrong. That's part of it. Why did he die on the cross? So we can have our, our sins washed away and we can go out and have more fun. We can ask for forgiveness and then go out and sin and come back and get more for, you know. We can keep going back and forth. See, we can do that. No. That only lasts for a, a season then when you know about it and you know you're not supposed to do it and you do it, guess what? There's no more forgiveness and you're in trouble. But Jesus' priority is the kingdom. Jesus never preached born again. He only said it once to a religious leader when the question was the importance, but the religion picked up what he said instead of what the truth was. The truth that uh, Nicodemus wanted to find out was one thing. How do I get into the kingdom? Why would he say, 
How do I get into the kingdom? That was the question. We don't pick up on how. We just pick up on what Jesus told him. Born again. We have to understand about being born again. Yes, I understand that. But that's the only time he talked about it. But the only reason he talked about being born again was to talk about how did he enter the kingdom. Now, why would he ask him how to get into the kingdom? What did Jesus preach? The kingdom. He came to this earth to bring the kingdom. He came here to teach you about the kingdom, about to teach me about the kingdom, understanding the kingdom. Now, I, I was going to start out this way again, and I'm going to hit it just a little bit because I believe it goes right in here. And that was one of the things that I, the reason I started this place to begin with, and I've, I've given you a lot of reasons, but the actual beginning was back in 1980 when I said I'm sick and tired of the Christians losing the victory, including myself. And I thought I was doing better than I was sometimes, but I think I've kind of fallen back again. So I have to reevaluate and get back on top of things. And that's what I'm doing right now. And I said, well, Lord, I wonder about victory. What does victory really mean? Again, you, we've heard this before, but you might have to hear it a few more times to finally get it fully inside you, and that is this. Victory means, according to Webster's, was it 1828, Chris? Yep. I went back and looked it up. There was two sections. One was a worldly, one was a Christian. And then the Christian part said it, it was the advantage, and I changed this superiority, over to another point, but I'm going to say it this way. The advantage over spiritual enemies, over passions, over appetites, over temptation, over any struggle or competition. Now, I wouldn't change the superiority to into one other thing was knowledge of authority. Knowledge of authority. What is your knowledge of the authority that the kingdom of God has given you? What is your authority? What can you do and what you cannot do is going to make your life change. And why don't you have authority? You might bind a strong man's spirit, as I've talked about many times. But it don't get, don't get bound up. Good English. It does not respond to you. Why doesn't it respond to you? Because you don't have the right stuff because you are not walking in the authority that you know you should have. That's not having victory. Every time you bind a strong man's spirit, boom, it should stop right there and look at you. We had an experience just lately trying to deal with some issues. It wasn't being dealt. I said, okay, I've had it. Bind you in the name of Jesus. Wham! Slammed right down to it, and it was done. Why? Because I was playing around with it. I was trying to be nice. You can't be nice to spirits. You have to get serious with spirits. You have to want to change. You have to realize your authority. You have to go in there and realize that's what's coming against you. Every person that comes against you has a spirit behind them, and you allow them to have the authority over you. You don't want to change because you're just, oh, well, it's so nice. It doesn't bother me. Woo! We're living in deception a lot of times. Again, knowledge of authority over spiritual enemies, over passions, over appetites, over temptations. No, nobody's had any of those so far. We're in good shape. And over struggles or competitions. Ah, no big deal. Why do I pray and it doesn't happen? Bible says to do this. Guess what? It doesn't work. Yes, it does. Why doesn't it work? Because you don't know the knowledge of the authority that you, because you're doing something that doesn't give you the authority to receive what the Bible says.
some of it we don't understand the kingdom. And so I said, well, what's authority? So I went back to the same Webster Dictionary and said, huh. See, I said the kingdom of God is all about authority. Everything in your life is about authority. Either your words give authority to the devil or the words give authority to God to bless and help people. Every word you speak, and you will be accountable for every one of them. Woo, that's written down in the book of remembrance. You're in trouble if you get there and say, well, let's open up the book of remembrance. Well, it's been washed away by the blood. If it's sin, yes. If it isn't, it's actions that you've done. Everything you've done is written down. The Bible says that every word that you speak, you will be accountable for. Now, if that's something that you don't believe, let me know. I'll look at it. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. But the authority, a legal power or a right to command or to act. What is your legal authority? Do you believe in your legal, legal authority? If you don't believe in it, guess what? It's because you don't have the knowledge about it. You're missing something. Anybody remember the, the walls that I said, the foundation? And what happened to the foundations? You get the word, and you put a word here. You build a block up. It's just got the outer casing on it. But when you stand on it, it goes boom. It just breaks down because there's nothing in the middle. You're missing something from the word of God. Sometimes the word of God says you can do this, but over here you got to do this in order to get this to go that. To go. And I can explain it, but I'm not going to right now because that's not what I'm talking about. You should know by now that there's different things that you need to do in order to make things work. That's why this place was set up. That's why I said last, well, was it last week or two weeks ago? If you've been here three years and you aren't casting out demons, healing the sick, and raising the dead, there's something wrong. That's why I said I'm coming towards me because I should have been raising you up to do that. And I haven't done that, and I apologize for that. But that's why the Lord said, the priority is kingdom. I have not gone and done that. I got off of the kingdom authority. I got off of the understanding of how to raise you up. What do you think Jesus did with the disciples for three years? He built a kingdom in them. He trained them into kingdom culture. What is kingdom culture like? Ask God. He created it. What's kingdom culture like? Would it be nice to be in the kingdom culture? Jesus never spoke to a crowd about being born again. But yet we put born again as a high level of what we got to talk about. Jesus didn't do that. He taught the kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. There was a man that said, I'd been through seminary and never heard one thing about the kingdom of God. Yet in the Bible it says, Seek ye first. No, we go to this meeting, and we seek that meeting. No, we go to this meeting, and we seek that meeting. No, we go over here, and we find out what's going on there. You're only walking in the revelations of those people. Now, if God spoke to you and told you to go there, go there. Why? Simply because when you go there, you can get revelation. You can get understanding, but the problem is, and this comes right from God, you are looking at man and the way God, the way this religion spirit has made things, and you have never asked him on whether you're supposed to go or what you're supposed to be learning now because so many times, and this is what the Lord said when I was going through this, he said, my people, if you take and you realize you get born again, and I brought it up again, that's the word, if you get saved, born again, 
you get put into the kingdom of God, you are now a child. He says, then all of a sudden we eat them up. We don't take care of them. We kill them. Oh, let's go tell everybody about the world. God's so good. I'm just blessed. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Every time they pray, guess what? It happens. It happens. Why? God wants to bless them. They're babies. He, God's taking care of them. God's taking care of them. A lot of cases, the, the Christians aren't taking care of them. They're killing them. Let's go out and tell somebody about Jesus. Oh, no, you're just too wild. Oh, no, you're just excited. Just, just wait. It'll die out. You'll be fine. I've had that happen before. I got excited one time. Oh, no, just calm down that you can't be excited. Kill them. Kill them quick. Then we take, and there's a season here in which we get babies going, and you have to take care of them. If, if we had babies in the physical, and you just let them go and never did anything, what would they do? They'd die. Then, once that happens, what goes on? Then they grow a little bit, and they said, well, I can do this. So the toddler stage comes up. The toddler, the threes and twos and all that stuff, and they're out trying to do this, and they hit their head, and, and they cry a little bit, but they don't want you to do anything. They want to do it themselves. When people get to that stage, I want to do this because I used to pray, and it used to work, and I pray now, and it doesn't work. They get hurt. Well, God doesn't love me anymore. We lose more people in the toddler stage than we do anywhere in the, in the people, in the body of Christ. Why? Because we're not there maturing them we're not there discipling them and then we took and we went in and when they get up older they go into sixth grade oh i like that guy over there they're going into sixth grade but they've never had anywhere from second to sixth grade training or understanding and that's why i said god spoke it to me as i was standing here i have not told you to go here. I have not told you to go there. You haven't learned this in order to be able to understand what's over there. So people go over here. You're walking in their revelation. You go over here. You're walking in their revelation. Oh, it's great. It's awesome. So he's tried to do something. It's not what God wants. It's not what's going on. I've seen this before. People want to bring something down here. It's so awesome. And they want to bring it into this area. And I'm sitting here and I'm saying, that isn't what God wants. It won't work. It falls apart every time. Why don't we get into what God wants? Why don't we get into the place where God tells us to go? Why don't what we learn? You know, just lately, I've watched a person, and I've said this for some time. You have everything you need inside you, which is the Holy Spirit. He is the comforter. He has given you everything. He is the teacher. He will give you everything you need. Oh, no, we want to go over here to this meeting and list what's going on because that's got some good stuff over here. If God tells you, go. I'm not going to say you can't go because it's what you want. It's not what God wants. Ask him what he wants. And I said one thing. Whenever you get in a position, start to call on the Holy Spirit and tell you what's going on. We got in some situations here lately. And I watched a person literally get into the Holy Ghost and let the Holy Ghost lead them. I said, that's what we're about. Training you to learn how to learn on the, on the Holy Spirit. Not to make you controlled by me or the next person that's over, or a leader here. No, get in and start to listen to the Holy Ghost. When you hear, find out why. As I said one time, I stood up and I was going to go pray for a guy. He was a Christian. He had a meeting, and his hand was all withered. I'm saying, this is horrible, this man of God with a withered hand. Go talk to him. I'm going to go heal him. I've been in the third meeting. I said, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to go heal him. I got up to walk, and I was kind of weak back then, so I didn't get up real fast. And I just kind of got up and walked, and I think, I'll go pray for him, and God will heal him. All of a sudden, God says, why? What's the purpose? Uh, I knew I was in trouble. 
Because, see, you've got to remember, most people have never done this. And I mean, they might have said it, but they've never really done this. In 1980, I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. Not my will, but thy will. From that moment on, he took me serious because I was serious. And every time I've done something, he's always corrected me. And I've always been open to him. Why? Because I don't know what's going on. God does. And when he does, guess what? He'll teach you. He'll show you. He'll give you revelation knowledge you've never seen before. Revelation knowledge you've never seen before. God is awesome. But see, all he's about is his kingdom. One thing before I go too far. This is what happened. The Lord is really hitting me hard. That's why he brought me back to this, because I would have went on. He says, he says, where have you been? Have you gone through, in your spiritual walk, have you gone through first grade yet? Have you gone through second grade? Or have you jumped over all those and you went up to where somebody's been in sixth grade and they, everybody's taught you from sixth grade, but you don't have enough fourth grade education to maintain your sixth grade movement? Why do you think that happens when people are out there and they fall? Because they never took care of what was supposed to be back here to keep them in order. They get out there, they start going, they do all kinds of great things. People get around and put them on a high pedestal. That's why I refuse to go on a high pedestal. Because you know what? You might have a lot of wisdom, you might have a lot of knowledge, but immediately when you're up there and you start to do something and you haven't got everything shored up on the bottom of your pedestal, because you missed a grade, you missed part of your life, you missed part of the word that you're supposed to do, and you haven't done it. God might have came up and had somebody say, you need to repent in this area. Oh, no, I'm fine, I'm doing good. This, this pastor over here said, I don't have to worry about it. That man over there said, oh, he never did anything like that. Comes up with Joyce Meyer, Joyce Meyer said, she can this, seen this person that was so powerful in the Lord. She went out, and, and they used to go in. He, she locked herself in a room six hours. And he would get all this revelation. So what'd she do? She locked herself in, told everybody, I'm going in this room for six hours. Within one hour, she was sleeping. She says, well, I told him I'm going to be in here for six hours. I can't leave now, but I'm not doing anything. So she slept more, and she did pray. And read the word. She just wiped out. She tried to do something that somebody else was doing that she was never required to do or was supposed to do. And she had to repent of that, but she made sure that everybody knew she was in there for six hours. And then she started using it as a teaching tool when she got set up and got it figured out what was going on to help others. Don't do what others do. Do what God wants you to do. Again, the Lord said some of you have to go back to the beginning because you miss things that you don't understand, which is causing your problems today. You said, why is it working? You missed it. You got to go back and find out why. And how are you going to find that out? Call on the Holy Spirit. Well, I'd better go to this meeting. They're going to talk about it. No, call on the Holy Spirit. I better go. no. Call on the Holy Spirit. Find the person that you're around, that you're under. If you aren't under, you need to find one. That's what we're doing with a, a family fellowships. If I haven't talked to you, please, I'll talk to you before you leave. Take a little time before you leave, and I'll finish up talking to people that I haven't talked to. Some of them have to be. I don't have the information when they're going to be able to be there. The other ones are different timing. So we might try to figure some things out for you. So the thing is, God is saying, I want you to set up the kingdom. I want you to set up a kingdom. I want you to move in the way that you want, you're supposed to be moving. See, because what happens is 
Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. How many people want something to have to work and strive and go crazy for? I'm never going to have anything easy. Sorry, Charlie, you don't know the kingdom of God. God will do it. That's the same thing with Debbie and I. We left the other day questioning what was going to happen financially. We came back and we're better shaped than we ever were. Because I asked God, and he sent me places I couldn't believe I'd go to or could afford to go to. And when I came back, we were better off financially when we went. About fell over. I said, Lord, why didn't I ask you this before? <laughs> why didn't I talk to you before? I know a lot of the scriptures, but I don't use them. Why don't we use them? Why don't we believe them when we do use them? God's putting out the kingdom of God, which is the authority. It was interesting because the speaker was talking about Effective communication depends on a correct concepts. When you're going to communicate, you need to make sure their concept, the person you're talking to, concept the same as yours. Good example. There was a person that we know just lately. They had a picture with a white cowboy hat on. And we said, wow, looks pretty good. But then after talking with them, they said, my wife, which is Afro-American, didn't like my cowboy hat. And I didn't find out exactly why, but I almost know why, because down south, a white boy with a cowboy hat means plantations, means money. Think about that. Where they grew up with the Afro-Americans was like slavery. So she said, oh, I forgot I married a white boy. The concept of her thinking was different than what he was portraying. He thought he was pretty cool. Nice looking, beautiful, white cowboy hat, looking good, spiffy. But it affected her because her concept was different. Why do you think we have problems in the church today? Why do you think we have problems in the church today? I can tell you something, and if your concept is different than what I'm talking about or trying to communicate you with, you're going to blow up and go crazy and get mad and upset and everything else. Now, if you're walking according to the word of God, it says that if you have odd or error or you have a problem with a person, what do you do? You go to that person and talk to them. No, we just talk to our best friend. Bible says you pick up the offense from another. It's like picking up a dog by his ears. What are you going to do? When you put it down, it's going to bite you. You hope it ain't a pit bull that might take your leg off. Too much of that's going on. That's one thing. When we get into kingdom culture, we'll stop happening. Kingdom understanding will bring differences. Last night sitting on the edge of bed and I was just thinking and the Holy Ghost really hit me hard. I says, wow, what is this? And I about to start crying. I'm thinking, why am I crying over this? Because I started thinking about when I was in basic training. You don't cry about basic training. There were some guys that cried a lot. Their hair got cut off. And a lot of people cry. Well, they didn't cry. They about killed the guy. He walked out in the and we're all standing in formation early morning, cold out. We're in Louisiana in the winter during December, and it's cold in the morning, and by noon it's 70, 80 degrees, and he walks out with his field jacket on, one man, 
in the military. One has them. They all have them. Right, Chris? Woo, doggies. We all grumbled as we went back to the barracks to get our field jackets because we knew what was going to happen when it hit 80 year degrees and our field jacket had to be on. That guy never did come out with his field jacket again, I guarantee you what. In fact, some people passed out from heat exhaustion that day. They had to take him to the infirmary because of the man wore the, you know, that, that makes you mad. Praise God, I had the love of God in me. I didn't get that way. But the fact is, it was so awesome because the Lord showed me. He blessed me. And I, I was thinking about this. I've talked about it before. But we had a sergeant. Ours was the third platoon. There was four platoons there. And we were the third one. We were kind of off the back. We had two roads here, and, and they had three here with, a, with a, uh, the, PA, or the uh, uh, mess hall. And the offices were over here, and we were across the street by the, the field. And we were, I was just sitting there and remembering last night, I'm saying, wow. We got there in about a week, right in the middle of the week. We are trying to get it set up. You've got to have your bed so that you can flip a quarter on it. Anybody, can you, can you make a bed to where you can flip a quarter on it? I didn't know how to make a bed, period, let alone flip a quarter on it. In fact, some of these guys still had a problem after a week or two of being there. It took me a few days. I didn't think it was possible. It is. <laughs> then it teaches you how to roll your socks up the right size, the right height, and your underwear and your T-shirts and anything else that was supposed to be in there. They just roll them all up and put them in the right perfect order. Most guys couldn't even figure out how to do that to begin with because they don't know how to do things like that when they came from this place. So they always want to mess with you in basic training. And the first week, about three days in, all of a sudden, it seemed like we just got a chance to lay down after they ran us, I don't know, three, out, three miles and did all of us, you know, the push-ups and the, you know, all the exercise. We're exhausted. We got there, laid down. It seemed like we just laid down. All of a sudden, this sergeant from platoon number one came in. He was an E6 sergeant, and he took, and, and all of a sudden, he just start, come on, get up, and he start yelling and cussing and swearing. I, I got a whole new language when I was in the military, things I never heard before. And the more or longer I was around it, the more it started to stick to me, and I had to watch what was coming out of my mouth. So what you're around, you become like, woo, doggies, that's true. So anyway... We were all standing up there kind of, mm, what's going on? Old man didn't know what was going to happen. He was just going to put have us do more calisthenics and everything else right there. And All of a sudden, the door flew open, and here comes our sergeant. He, was, he wasn't a drill sergeant. This other guy was a drill sergeant. This guy was an E7. He was our platoon sergeant. And he walked in, and he says, get outside. And the guy looked at him, and he says, and he kind of went outside. He says, now, you guys, you take and you get settled down here. He says, I will be back. And he walked outside, and he, you know, down there they had no insulation in the side. It's just slats on the buildings. And you're sitting there, and all of a sudden you hear him screaming at him. This is my platoon. You never come in here, and you do not affect the, my people. You ne and if you do, I w man, he was going down the line. He took care of him. That night he came in. He says, come over and sit down. So he put up a chair, and we sat down. He started talking. He says, people, you belong to me, and I'm going to make you a soldier. And by the time he got through talking, he says, you never take and talk to anybody, especially an officer, above the enlisted men, in front of the enlisted men. That's disrespectful. He says, you do it. You push them off the side, and you wait till you get away from them. One of the biggest things we've done, we've had some things like that happen here. We've been very disrespectful to one another, and I apologize for that, for allowing it to happen. If it hasn't happened to you, I praise God that it hasn't. And from now on, I pray it never does because I'm bringing forth respect back in this place. 
I haven't done that. That's one thing the Lord said. I've let things happen that never should have happened. I'm bringing respect back. You walk in this place, when you walk through that door, God is in this place. If you don't want to respect God, don't walk in the door. He's been waiting for you to come into this place, and if you come into this place and do anything else but respect the Lord. It's the same thing is with that sergeant walking in and trying to disrespect us. God said, no, you're not coming in here. Respect somebody that's in this place because they're my children. I'm going to grow them. I'm going to bring them up. I'm going to bring them into a place where they're better than they were before, and I'm going to bring forth with the power of God and the understanding that he's giving me, the ability to bring forth a kingdom culture. A while back, I talked about how culture changed everything. Culture has changed everything. What do you think kingdom culture is going to do? It's going to change you. It's going to change the world. It is going to change situations that seem impossible. That's what God wants, setting up his kingdom and bringing a kingdom culture. But another thing I'm going to say, phones, I use it. My Bible's on it. If I hear of anybody playing games, if I have anybody talking about where they're looking up something other than the word of God in this place while I'm teaching, if you're talking while I'm teaching, if the music's going while we're praising and worshiping and you get up and you go get coffee, I'm sorry. You're disrespecting God. We're worshiping the Lord. If you don't like the songs, you're disrespecting God. You're disrespecting the person that made the music up there. Whether you like it or not, you can talk to us later. But if you're angry in the midst of it, you're coming against God. If you don't respect God, how do you expect God to respect you? If you want to go to the Bible, the Bible says, if you will not tell others about me, I used to sit there for years saying, God, I'm going to get before you and you're going to come against me because I'm not telling anybody about you. Because what is Jesus going to do? He's not going to tell the Father about me if I don't tell people about him. Read it. It's in the Bible. Well, I'm doing all this good work. Yeah. For yourself. Not for me, what the Lord would say. There's a change coming in this place. Because the Lord is saying, I'm going to pour out people into this place. They're looking for a place that they have not seen in the body of Christ. I have taken and listened to a CD that was given to us. We listened to it on the way to Ventura yesterday. And I said, wow. This is powerful. And this man was mentioning about a person who had a, uh, a garden. He started to study horticulture and found out, and probably the, the people who grow plants understand that underneath the leaf is where the moisture absorbs into the plant. And he got to saying, you know, he even brought this out because he's been involved with outpourings of the Holy Spirit. When you outpour the Holy Spirit, it's good. But God in the garden used the mist underneath the leaves to make the plants grow. He started to water, spray water up under the plants. He said they went from raising a walnut tree, it took five years to grow, up to three years, and the walnuts were bigger because he was doing it God's way. Not the way we're used to. He says, in the past, we've had outpourings coming upon us. He says, that's not going to happen anymore. He says, we need to take and do one thing. We need to work together and respect and honor one another's gifts. Why? Because when you respect one another's gifts, what you're doing is you're bringing forth the, the anointing. You're bringing forth encouragement. You're bringing forth and you're watering each plant the way God would water it. And you're going to grow and you're going to see things happen like never before. I said, wow, it's amazing. Think about that. 
Are you honoring the gift of the person beside you? I have said this many times. I respect your gift. I respect your gift. I have always tried to see what type of gift you've got, what your personality is. I try to work together. I try to bring you in. I'm saying, okay, I want to feed you the power of the Holy Spirit and give you some words of encouragement. The Bible says that a word of encouragement is like, I think it's in Proverbs, it says, uh, maybe it's 26, but it said, a word of encouragement is like a honeycomb. It's health to the bones. The bones is your structure. How many times when somebody walks up and says, thank you, I appreciate you, you really help me. You can do two things. You can accept it and praise God that you're able to do that, or you can say, Leah, look at me. Get into pride. But if you don't get into pride and you say, wow, that was encouraging, that what I'm doing is changing people's lives. That's kingdom culture. That's kingdom culture. This teacher went on to say in Genesis 3.15, And I put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And he went on to talk about how Jesus was a seed of the woman that came and bruised the head of the serpent. Took him out. Took the authority over him. And he said, he was asking God why did it take 4,000 years from the time Adam died and fell until Jesus came to this earth? Why did it take 4,000 years? And the Lord started to speak to him and show him one thing. In the word it says, I sent my son in the fullness of time. And the fullness of time meant, when he was checking it out, he says, at the right place. So he started asking God, he says, why at the right place? Why did it take 4,000 years? And the Lord said it took 4,000 years to get the right place prototype see communication was you can't communicate something to somebody if they don't understand what you're talking about and we do that all the time we just say something thinking somebody's going to know but we never get to know them to find out if they're going to accept what you're saying so you get into a communication problem you get anger you get frustration why aren't they listening to me they should know i told them Sorry, they didn't understand a word you said because they don't know what's going on. Their concept is different. I put a cowboy hat on and I offend somebody. Anybody think wearing a cowboy with a hat would offend somebody? I didn't. But that's what we do all the time. But when we get kingdom culture we learn how to find out about that person before we flip our communication upon them to make them mad then we can understand how to communicate them more correctly thus jesus or i mean god did the same thing he was saying that through four thousand years there was not one kingdom that would look like what God would set on this earth. He says, how can I put the kingdom, my kingdom out, so that people will understand what I'm talking about? They won't. Their only understanding of a kingdom was this. When a king conquered a land, they would immediately go in, kill all the men that were strong, 
take the young men captive and the women and all the spoils and bring it back to their lands and enslave them. God does not do that. That was the only prototype of a kingdom. Now, if Jesus came back, what do you think people would say? Well, that's what we got to do. We got to go over and make everybody slaves. We got to conquer land and make them slaves because that's the only understanding they had. Wow. There's some real revelation here if you will listen to what's being said. You might have misunderstood something that's been said in this place. You might have a total different concept, and we've been speaking this way. That's why when people get in there, we had one guy that said, well, Shane Wall said he went to a conference. And he said he had, the, in the conference, it's supposed to be one of the largest churches in the area. And I started checking it out. I know why now. But the fact of the matter is, he said he had unsaved people write the information about his church. I said, what? He said, because what you put down there, they can't understand it. You put something out, they don't know what you're talking about. Have you ever heard anybody says, quit talking Christianese? Why? They don't know what you're talking about. They've not been around Christians. You might have somebody said, what's born again? No. Oh. oh, yeah. Well, you better know what born again means. Some of you might say, what's righteousness? Well, you better know what righteousness means. You know, I'm righteous. What, what, you're what? Who, what are you talking about? See, they have no concept of it. In order for us to grow in kingdom culture, kingdom understanding, to achieve what the Lord wants to do in this place, because this is set up by God, not I. And this is what the Lord is saying. Some of us have to go back to school. Some of us have to start learning where we missed out so that we can achieve what we're supposed to do. Some of us to jump from here, from first grade all the way up to 12th grade and start hearing stuff. I was one time up in northwest Iowa. We lived up there with a lot of the jobs that we had. There's like four jobs up there. Sorry to say. But anyway, I was up there, and I, I, the only well that we could have, which is you get the Holy Spirit coming out of, you know, and you could get f filled back up and feel great, was Kenneth Copeland's TV program. And I was there, and I was listening to it. I got so excited about what he was saying. He was like, this is awesome. I got to talk to somebody. There's nobody around I can talk to because they're all Dutch Reformed people like I used to be, and they're not going to understand it. I was blowing up inside it. Oh, I got to talk to somebody. We knew the Assembly of God pastor up north in Inwood, Iowa. We lived in Rock Valley. And I said, wow, I was out doing some sales calls, so I said, I'm going to stop in and talk to the pastor. He's got to understand this one. I went in there, and we got there, and we started talking, and I says, oh, Kenneth Copeland put on this word, and it was, he, I said what it was, and the guy got looking sick. And I said, what's the problem? He said, oh, that man. I have had to help so many people change because what he said they got ruined and it just depressed me so bad i'm sitting here i'm so empowered by the holy spirit saying yes lord let's do it and i hear the pastor of assembly of god church a spirit-filled denomination i can understand the dutch report you know the dutch reform people not accepting it but the assembly of god people not accepting. Well, I said, what is this? And I, I, I struggled with that. And finally the Lord said, because they have never got trained to maintain what they're hearing 
from Kenneth Copeland. They get hurt. And this pastor's patching the hurt. So he's turned against Kenneth Copeland. I says, oh, religion. It has happened all the time. It goes on today. And I said, God, help us. Help us, Lord. We got to change this. That's why, that was before 1980. In fact, it was early 1980, when, very early 1980, when, we were, when that happened. And afterwards, I said, God, I'm sick of the Christians losing the victory. Losing the victory. The authority, or the knowledge of the authority over the spiritual enemies. I didn't even know what I was saying at the time. I just knew I was sick of it. But God started to show me. We're still working on it. I said, Lord, forgive me. We're going to make this thing strong. We're going after it. We're going to make things happen. But he said, Roman, now I'm flipping back over and back into my 4,000 years again. As I talked to my wife, she says, where are you at? I says, okay, I've got to go back and explain because I flip plates back and forth. But the Roman Empire was the first kingdom that set up the prototype that God kingdom would be like. What they did was they went and they took and they would conquer a land. And in conquering the land, they would have a king which was Caesar and he would pick up somebody from his court and he would send them out to that land and that person would become a governor. And that governor, they never took people from the land and brought them into the kingdom. They left them there. But when they went in, they trained them how to be a Roman. They taught them the Roman language. They taught them the understandings of the laws of the Roman. They changed their whole culture around. Miles Monroe has talked about that many times. When you, he says he was in Bahamas. And the English people came in and took over the land. They sent a governor. And the governor changed their culture. Changed their lingu lingu language. Instead of speaking Bohemian, they spoke English. Now they drive on the right side of the road. Or the left side. It's just the opposite of we do. So on the left side. See, they, they changed the culture. They changed the, he said he used to remember being there as a little son, a little boy with his, you know, suit on, tie on, and the English flag as the parade went down to, to worship the, you know, to praise the, the queen. He changed the culture. The Holy Spirit has come to you to change your culture. If you've given your life to the Lord, he has sent the Holy Spirit to change your culture. If you're not changing, I'm telling you right now, there is a war that is going on inside. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. God is a gentleman. He's not going to force you. But there is desires rising up inside of you, and you're not obeying them. And I'll tell you what, God will get you. You might say, well, I don't understand that. Now, this is what I was going to start up with. Because the Lord said, move on. What is your culture? And how do people see you? Or not culture, but your character. What is your character and how does people see you? I always said our daughter, when she was here on this earth, if we wanted her at a meeting, we would tell her two hours early before we... Because... She would take two hours. She was always two hours late. She would never get at a place. You say 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, she'd be there. Guarantee you. I knew her culture. My culture used to be I was late all the time. I'm always waiting to the last minute to get anything done. Oh, that's still possible. 
but I'm usually not late now because my wife has changed my culture. She's always 15 minutes early. If she's going to be 15 minutes early, well, guess what? I'm going to have to be 15 minutes early. Yeah, or I drive my own car. <laughs> but see, our culture, what is, what is people looking at you? What are they seeing in you? What is your culture? What is your character? I'll change that back. What is your character? What do you do? And the Lord started to hit me about our character. How do we make our character happen? It's from the roots and what you pull from. If you look at that, many times I talk about every word spoken over you, every word you speak over yourself, because if somebody speaks something over you long enough, it becomes what you speak over yourself because you start to believe it. So you're speaking it over yourself and condemning yourself unless it's a good word. And any physical action and any deeds come against you. Immediately those were planted in your heart. The root comes down. And whatever that root's hooked to, if it's evil or if it's good, it pulls out of that. The only way you can get rid of that is when you get rid of the seeds, when you get rid of the roots that you're feeding off of. And the Lord came down and started to say, grafted. What were you grafted into? How were you grafted? When you were born, you were grafted into your family. How does your family operate? So you still have a personality, and sometimes your personality changes you. I remember Debbie was saying about her household wasn't so good, and I can contest to that. But the lady across the street, Barb, she always seen her and says, I want a family like that, not like what we got here. So she started feeding off of what she was seeing, so it started to change her character. What are you feeding off of? What's in you that's still feeding you and teaching you? What are you doing? And I went back and I looked up graft. And there's a lot of it. It's talking about how uh, horticulturally they took in. If you take a, a, a stick or a, they talk about, what was it, you know, uh, shoots or buds. And they take, and probably Karen or somebody has been doing gardening could tell you a lot better, but I think they kind of, I've seen them slice across the, a branch, and they put that inside, and they wrap it up tight, and they kind of watch over it and keep it going before long. All of a sudden, they start grafting in, and you've got a long shoot coming out, and you've got a branch. Now, does that branch reproduce anything different? No, if you put an apple branch and graft it into a peach, you got a peach apple tree. Because you'll have apples coming off the branch you grafted in. So your character never changes. Your, your gifting never changes. You're still going to produce. The difference is you have changed what you're pulling from the roots of the apple tree onto the peach tree. Now the whole food mechanism comes from there to feed it and to bring it forth. How do you get your fruit to grow on a, on a tree? By the food that comes through the roots. And I said, wow, that's interesting. And I started thinking about that a lot. And we go back to Romans eleven seventeen, thirteen 13 through 24. Debbie, if you mind reading that. Sorry, but I didn't tell you on that one. It should be up there. That's on the wall. Yeah. Read it anyway. Uh, it must be for me. I'm saying all this especially for you, Gentiles. God has appointed me as the apostle to the Gentiles. I stress this. For I want somehow to make the people of Israel jealous of what you Gentiles have. So I might save some of them. For since their rejection meant that God offered salvation to the rest of the world, their acceptance will be even more wonderful. It will be life for those who were dead. And since Abraham and the other patriarchs were holy, their descendants will also be holy, just as the entire batch of dough is holy because of the portion given as an offering is holy. For if the roots of the tree are holy, the branches will be too. 
But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel, have been broken off. And you Gentiles, who were branches from a wild olive tree, have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. But ooh, you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. You are just a branch, not the root. Well, you may say, those branches were broken off to make more room for me. Yes, but remember, those branches were broken off because they did not believe in Christ, and you are there because you do believe. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe towards those who disobey, but kind to you if you continue to trust in his kindness. But if you stop trusting, you will also be cut off. And if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again, for God has the power to graft them back into the tree. <sighs> you by nature were a branch cut from a wild olive tree. So if God was willing to do something contrary to nature by grafting you into his cultivated tree, he will be far more eagle, eager to graft the original branches back into the trees where they belong. Oh. Yeah, praise the Lord. Praise. Think about that. I got to be attached to the mic to make you hear me better. <laughs> got to be grafted in. <laughs> but, but see, the Lord has been hitting me this week. What are your roots? What are you pulling from? What are you pulling from? What are you grafted into? God wants to take you and graft you into the kingdom culture. He wants to bring you into a new understanding of the kingdom. He wants you to walk in authority and power. So what are you going to have? A knowledge of authority and whatever you say, boom, happens. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wow, look at the situations that would come down, the people that are hurting. What could we do? I know for a fact there was a guy that was talking about a revival way back when. He says they would encompass the, the hospital hand-to-hand, -hand, kings in the kingdom of God. He didn't say that, but I'm saying that. But they're all saved. They all loved God. They all had the authority and understood. And they started to proclaim and decree the word over, and every person in the hospital came out saved, delivered, and healed. Now, what don't you have that was different than they, what they have? What are we missing? What is happening? The Lord said, I need to close it, and I'm going to close it. God is a gardener. God is a gardener. In John 15, 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is a gardener. Jesus is the true vine, and the Father is a gardener. If we are grafted into anything other than Jesus, if we're pulling from anything other than Jesus. If we're watching things that are not allowing us to flow from Jesus. If we're doing things that are not allowing us to flow from Jesus, how can Jesus honor us? How can he honor our giftings? How can he help us grow the things that we want to have happen? His heart is to give you the desires of your heart. But where there's too many roots there that you're attached to. The roots haven't been transferred over to the main vine. We have a problem. And I'm saying all of this to say one thing. This week we are starting 
And I wasn't going to do this, but this is what the Lord's saying. A breakdown of, of the family fellowship that we've had on 2 o'clock, on Tuesday at 6.30. We have one on Tuesday at 6.30. We have one on Wednesday at 6.30. As of right now, they're right here. We'll be wa talking more about it as we go along. Uh, in the, the family fellowships, what we'll do if they stay here, if they go to a home, we're looking for leaders because it's not just a leader. We know leaders. See, again, I'm going to make the prototype of the leader the way God wants the leader to be. I've never done that before. I just found somebody to take the position, and when that happened, guess what? We just had a position. We just had a meeting. Uh-uh, we ain't going to have a meeting. We are going to have kingdom of God culture training in those places we're going to find out if there's areas in your life that you're missing that you need to get retrained up so that you can do what you're called to do within three years if you've been in any of these meetings if we're doing correctly and we set it up correctly every one of you will walk into a place and hey pray for him just walk up lay hands on healed wow just like the man on the stairs, when they walked by and they said, an alms, and he says, silver and gold, do we have none? But what I give, I give unto you. Boom. What would happen? What would start to go on? Would that make you happy? You walk into a situation that's impossible. You say, okay, Holy Spirit, not my problem. You figure this one out. You tell me what to do. I'm your hands, your feet. Just do it. Let's go after it. He tells you what to do, and he says, okay, I got the authority to do this. Boom, and it's done. You don't have to take hours to pray to find out what you need to do. You just know because you know. You walk around. And it's not about a discontentment between I don't like them, I don't like them, these people are doing this, those people are doing this, this is happening, so what? has nothing to do with the fruit that God wants you to produce. People will run to you to grab the fruit. It's just like Elaine. How many people have gone to Elaine just hoping for a hug or some encouragement? That's our fruit. And people run into you for your fruit. Your words are your fruit. Do people run so they can get encouraged by you? But it says that you're going to live by every fruit, every word that comes out of your mouth. You will live by it. You will receive what comes from it. Have you forgotten that one? You say something and say, no big deal. It's done. It's over. They needed to hear it. Well, you do it to one, God will just release people to do it to you. Do you want nice words? Say nice words to other people. I put it out for many years. I've helped people. I've, I've brought cars up. I've done all kinds of things. I've been blessed, and I've blessed many. And sometimes I sit back and I said, Father, I've loved so many people and I've gone overboard to do things that I hated doing because I was stupid in letting it happen. But I loved them and I did it. That's what I did it. And all of a sudden I says, but you said it will return to me. For a long time it never returned to me. But I'll tell you what, you never know how many people open doors for me when I walk to a restaurant right now. I know it's the crutches, but, I mean, I'm like a king. I walk there, and phew, doors just open up. I'm thinking, praise God, I'm coming in, I'm, because I used to do it for everybody else. You know, I've even had people bring the car to me. Wow, I hate to have anybody do that, because I'm so used to doing it myself, but I had to humble myself in a way to say, okay. The things that you do will come back to you, and I guarantee you what? Some of the things I used to do, I didn't want them to come back to me, good, but they'll do it. Kingdom culture will change things around. The family fellowship, you might say, is a waste of my time. It's only a waste of thy time if you don't understand what it's for. If you do not understand what it's for. It's to develop you into the person that you need to be. And we need to develop the, the kingdom, the, the family fellowships even greater than what they are. So, 
how do we develop the concepts that people have to receive the fullness of what we need to do. You are a big part of this. This is what I'm going to talk about Tuesday night and Wednesday night. Ask God. Oh, what are we supposed to do? Ask God. See, there's a, there's a problem in the body. It comes down where I'm the leader, and you've got to follow what I want. Once the head has something for the church, you have to line up with it. No. In this place, kingdom, God is the Father. He is your king. He has placed me here to watch over and to assist you, to direct you in the way the Father is saying. You hear something, you tell me, I will ask the Lord, he'll explain it to me, it might not come back very quick, but I guarantee you what, it's not that I've ever forgot it. I'm still praying about it. I'm trying to figure out exactly how the Lord's wanting it to happen. Because I'll tell you what, I remember the time that I said I was supposed to go to college. I had my wife and another man that we were ministering with at the time said, no. You're not supposed to go to college. I said, yes, I heard. I'm supposed to go to college. So I got so determined about I was supposed to go to college. Bible college, that was. In the fall. I thought I'd be a nice guy and tell my employer that in the fall I was going to Bible college. Two weeks later, I got my two-week notice. I said, I said, I still need a job. I'm not going to the Bible college yet, not till this fall. Well, we, you said you're leaving. We're going to have to find somebody to replace you, and we have found somebody, so now we're replacing you. <laughs> Boy, you might hear something, but you might need to have a little revelation to find from somebody to make sure that what you're doing is right. It's not that I heard wrong. It was just that I was not prepared. I was so determine and i've watched that through years people get something they say we're going to do it great but then i start to look at it and i'm saying how's this going to work and then when i go in before the lord and he shows me what i'm supposed to do and and more times than not it works perfect it's just that i have to get the understanding that's where i'm at it's not that i come against anybody and if for some reason i hear something else i'll talk to them I won't just let them hang. They might feel like it, but I, I try not to let that happen. We are going to go and really start to work on kingdom culture. Each one of you have a place in it. And one thing he was saying in that CD, you know, in with this one for sure. I don't want to get like people. Well, this is my last ending out of the ten endings that I'm going to do. That's happened before. I said, Lord, I don't ever want to do that. He said one thing. I think it was the olive oil that came down against and at Mount Zion, and there was another mount, that, a mount of olives, and they're far away. He says, how can the oil fall down and touch both at the same time? And he said, when you honor the gift that's in each person to help them build and bring to their understanding and make them important. You start to build them up. You start just like watering underneath those plants and they start to grow faster and they start to change. It's not about what you are doing. You ask God and God might use you to water them. He says the oil can fall on one mountain and touch the other no matter how far it is apart because he needs all of us to do it and when we're all doing this and all talking to people and we're all encouraging people and we're all honoring the gift of the other person instead of coming against them because they aren't doing what we want them to do then guess what happens you start to have growth you start to change situations and this is what this is going to be when we start to come into the family fellowship, realizing 
We're not there for a meeting. We're there to help develop the kingdom. I have a part. You have a part. When we quit looking at it as a meeting, oh, I hate to go to these meetings. Oh, it's, eh, 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 eh. you know what? There's times I sit back and say, do I have to go? Oh, yeah, I have to. <laughs> I'm being honest, people. <laughs> I know. But the fact is, I understand. When I drove semi, 14 and three quarter hours in four days. I mean, 14 and three qu four, it was 13 and three quarter hours, which was actually 14 hours a day for four days. And then I came in and I worked the rest of the time with everybody. When I drove the semi, it was about nine hours. And then I would have church the next day. And I'd go out that night. When I sat there for hours talking to people, driving down the road, it wasn't about me. It was about God. I have a person that I need to talk to. And God said his will was he was supposed to be here. And I've talked to him on and off. The other day, the Lord just told me to release him. He would not. I can't release him, but he hasn't fulfilled God's will, and now he's going to release him from what God wanted in his life. Because God's getting serious. We either get serious now, or he'll release you from what's happening. Here, he might take you somewhere else. That's praise the Lord if that, that's between you and him. But there's a will for your life. That's all we want to do is fulfill your will. If you're supposed to be filled, fulfilled here, praise the Lord. We'll do all we can. If you're not, he's going to release you. And it was never a point. And I'm not coming against anybody. I'm not trying to tell you, oh, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm putting the heart of the Father out. God loves each and every one of you. He wants you to grow and prosper. He wants to complete you. He wants you to do things. He can't make you do anything. It's just the point that he loves you so much. He wants you to understand. And when you get to that point, you're going to have fun. You'll have fun. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you. I put this out in the way that I did the best I possibly could for you. I want you, Father, to be blessed. It's not about me. It's not to hurt anybody. But it's to give people the understanding what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it so I give you glory in all things I worship you I praise you I thank you for each and every person here I only ask that each person will produce the fruit it's like Sharon said when she was in the cemetery she was crying, and the Holy Spirit was crying through her. For all the people that took their gifts to the grave and never used them. So many people have done that. Our world would be totally different if we had not had that happen. And I pray that I won't ever be in that position. And I give you glory, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen. Protect and keep everybody safe until we meet again, amen.